Thank you so much for joining us. We're really pleased to have so many people on our webinar today interested in this very important, though disturbing, topic. My name is Marsha Harris. I'm a board member of Voice for Israel. And on behalf of Voice for Israel and the three organizations that have so graciously provided panelists for us today, I want to welcome you. For those of you that might not be familiar with Voice for Israel, we are a nonprofit, all volunteer organization based in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area. Uh, there will be a link to Voice for Israel in an email that you will receive tomorrow if you'd like to have more information about us. Some of us I know are just learning our way around Zoom and hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties today, but we ask for your patience if we do. If you are brand new to Zoom, I just want to point out a couple of features that will be helpful for you today. If you're coming in from a, a desktop computer, there is a Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen, and you can use that to ask questions of the panelists. And at the top of your screen, uh, there, there is an indicator for speaker view or gallery view. I would recommend, since we have so many panelists on the screen today, that you use gallery view. If you're coming in with the iPad, uh, the indicators are probably going to be in a little different location, and you might just have to look around for it. You also will receive in the email tomorrow a link to a sheet of resources, many of which we will be discussing today. And you don't have to worry about taking notes. Uh, the, the link will provide you the resources that we are suggesting that you and students that you come in contact with may want to use to support students that are facing issues of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel activity. Also, this session is being recorded, so if you have to leave early or if you want to just go back and review some things or you want to pass it on to others, you will have a link to the recording. I'd like to introduce our panelists now, and I want to thank our partners, Stand With Us, Amcha Initiative, and Alums for Campus Fairness for working with us on this important program. Over to my right, um, is Dr. Tammy Rossman Benjamin. Dr. Rossman Benjamin is a former faculty member at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She is founder and director of AMCHA Initiative, and she'll be telling you a little bit more about what that is. On your screen uh, below Tammy is Max Cherman. Max is our amazing student, and when you hear him speak, you will say, Understand why I say that. Max is a student, a senior at Duke University, pre-law student on his way to law school next year. We'd love to have him go to Duke or UNC so we can keep him in North Carolina. Uh, in the middle of your lower screen is Carly Gamble. Carly is an attorney and she is director of the Center for Combating Anti-Semitism, which is part of Stand With Us. And next to Carly is Joel Bond. Joel is Associate Director of Alums for Campus Fairness, and he will be telling you about the great work that they do. Before I turn the program to the panelists, I want to tell you about a call that I received about a year ago from a man who I did not know. He was referred to me by a mutual friend because I have a long background as a college administrator. And this man, we will call him Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz told me that his granddaughter had just started as a freshman at the University of Pittsburgh. It was her first week of school and she was walking down the hallway and a girl came up to her on the hall and said, Schwartz, are you Jewish? And his granddaughter said, yes, I am. And the girl said to her, I hate all the Jews. You stole the land from the Arabs. Now just imagine any young person you know, whether it's your own child or grandchild or niece or anyone that you know starting school and having this experience. Today we're going to hear about far more shocking and egregious experiences and incidents of harassment and intimidation. 
But I think what is especially disturbing about that story is this girl was not a pro-Israel activist. She didn't even have time to join a pro-Israel organization if she wanted to. She simply was walking down the hall in her dormitory. And because she was identifiable as a Jew, she was being verbally attacked and blamed and held accountable for all of the alleged misdeeds that Israel does. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So today we're going to hear from panelists about what the current situation is on campus regarding anti-Israel activity. And we're going to hear some suggestions from them about how all of us can confront this and address it. And I would like to start with Carly. You're going to be hearing initials of SJP, JVP, BDS today. So just to make sure everyone is aware of what these initials stand for, and they are what I call the troika of anti-Israel activity on campus. And Carly's gonna tell us a little bit about them. Carly, thank you. Thanks, Marcia. And uh, I just wanna say thank you to Voice for Israel, to you and Mike for hosting this, for inviting Stand With Us to be a part of it. Um, these webinars, as you know right now, are crucial. Uh, they're kind of a lifeline and a way for us to continue to educate. So thank you for having us. Um, as Marcia said, you're gonna be hearing these initials over and over if you haven't already. And I suspect that a lot of you, if not all of you have heard them and, and know what they are, but just kind of as a, uh, a reminder, a refresher, and it's it's, it's not something that we can cover in depth in a couple of minutes, but uh, you know we, we hear BDS a lot and we hear that on campus as well as in the community. And, and that just stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. So it's a, it's a movement that grew out of Palestinian civil society um, that, and, and there is nuance that, that needs to be uh, injected when we talk about BDS. Uh, there's a difference between the motivation of the founders of the BDS movement, uh, which anyone who has read their writings and listened to them talk knows that the goal of the actual BDS movement is the complete annihilation and destruction of the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, the nuance that has to be injected though is when we talk about people who support BDS campaigns who may or may not be anti-Semitic um, in, in their views or anti-Israel. Uh, they may be misguided, misinformed, or, uh, or, or, or somewhere along that spectrum. So that's a, it's an important nuance to keep in mind. Um, so, but that's what BDS is. And again, it, when, when we talk about boycott, uh, there are academic boycotts, which obviously is, is relevant for what we're talking about today. There are cultural boycotts, economic boycotts that are being called for uh, within this campaign. Uh, divestment, obviously calling upon, when, when BDS resolutions uh, come, come up on college campuses, generally what students are asking is that the administration divest from uh, Israeli companies and companies that are doing business uh, in, in Israel or in what they call the occupied territories. Um, and then sanctions obviously is a little bit separate and, and that's a call for government entities to impose sanctions upon the state of Israel. So that's what that means. Uh, and it, it looks a number of different ways, but generally on college campuses, it looks like resolutions coming before a student government body. Um, and I'm sure Max will be able to enlighten us a little bit more and we'll all talk a little bit more about how that really impacts students. And Tammy will, will also have a lot of information about that and, and why it's such a problem on campuses. Um, real quickly, uh, JVP is a student organization Jewish Voice for Peace, SJP, another student organization is Students for Justice in Palestine, um, that they, they tend to both be extremely um, anti-Israel and uh, generally what happens for pro-Israel students, Jewish or not, on campuses where those organizations exist is that there, uh, there are attempts to marginalize and to silence the pro-Israel voices, uh, the Jewish student voices. Uh, one of the more egregious ones that we've seen was at NYU uh, a little over a year ago when uh, the, those groups got together and, and decided that they wanted all of the other student organizations to boycott the two pro-Israel student groups on campus. Um, so, so this is what happens generally with those groups. Um, they, they host uh, their annual um, conferences on college campuses, which again, Tammy will be able to talk about the impact that that has on students. Uh, so I don't want to steal anyone's thunder there. But um, anyway, the, these are the things that you're that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about these groups, this BDS movement, how it's impacting student life on campus, um, and the various situations that we're seeing. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to stop there for now, Marcia. Thank you very much, Carly. Uh, Dr. Rossman Benjamin, would you tell us a little bit about what AMCA initiative is? and 
what are the re- findings? I know you have a recent report that's been published. Would you tell us a little sure. bit? About the yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marcia. And thanks, too, for um, hosting this really important um, webinar. I really appreciate the invitation and just getting the information out. Okay. So AMCHA initiative is dedicated to monitoring, investigating, and combating anti-Semitism on U.S. college and university campuses. AMCHA was founded by um, two University of California faculty members, myself, uh, as well as a colleague at UCLA. And our goal was to help to protect Jewish students from both classical and anti-Zionist motivated anti-Semitism that was coming from both their peers and their professors. Um, One important service that we offer is our online anti-Semitism tracker, which is the only publicly accessible database of anti-Semitic activity on U.S. campuses with over about 3,000 incidents on more than 400 campuses. If you haven't checked out our online database, I urge you to do so. It's on our website. That's amchainitiative.org, A-M-C-H-A initiative.org. Um, Another crucial part of what we do is empirical research. I mean, we're faculty members after all. Um, And included in that is our annual studies of anti-Semitic activity and trends on campuses across the country. These have been hugely important, not only in uncovering the nature and scope of anti-Semitism, campus anti-Semitism, but also really important in helping us to convince university leaders to actually do something about the problem. Um, It was Amcha's research, in fact, that revealed for the first time this very strong statistical correlation between anti-Israel campus activism, like BDS campaigns, and acts of anti-Jewish bullying, vandalism, and assault, which has been an important statistic in helping us make the case of the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Amcha's more recent studies have shown that while acts of classic anti-Semitism have continued to grow in both number and virulence off campus or outside of the university, on college campuses, acts of classical anti-Semitism like swastika graffiti or the distribution of um, neo-Nazi flyers, these kinds of acts have actually decreased over the last couple of years. But at the same time, anti-Zionist motivated acts that target um, Jewish and pro-Israel students for harm, these have increased dramatically in both number and intensity. Um, Our research shows that this is at least um, in some part, I would say in large part, a direct result of efforts by students and faculty to implement at their schools an academic boycott of Israel or academic BDS, which although it targets Israeli universities, it actually can't be implemented on a campus without directly harming any student um, who wants to study in or about or advocate on behalf of Israel. Academic BDS guidelines specifically call for um, boycotting um, or impeding the participation in programs, uh, educational programs that a school or outside organizations sponsor uh, to go to Israel. So, for instance, faculty members at University of Michigan refuse to write letters of recommendation for students who wanted to study in Israel. This was in accordance with the academic boycott. Um, faculty bodies at Pitzer College and NYU voted to uh, stop their educational programs abroad in Israel. And many attempts by SJP groups, we've, we've actually recorded across the country, to th- this, this tactic really of impeding student participation in trips to Israel like birthright with the tactic of publicly shaming students who want to participate who, or who have already participated in those trips. Um, but perhaps more importantly uh, than these sort of trying to stop these trips, the academic BDS guidelines also call for supporters to censure, protest, and boycott um, pro-Israel individuals and groups on campus. And th- this um, uh, motivation can be directly tied to the um, harassment and the attempt to silence pro-Israel and Jewish students and to exclude them from campus life. 
So Zionist students are increasingly vilified. They're accused of being racist, white supremacist, even baby killers. Their property is defaced with anti-Zionist slogans. Their pro-Israel events regularly protested and disrupted. And they or their pro-Israel uh, groups, as, as Carly was saying, are boycotted or oftentimes barred from participating in campus activities. And on campuses across the country, from San Francisco State to the University of Illinois to CUNY, there are graffitis and posters and chants proclaiming Zionists not welcome here, Zionists off our campus, Zionists out of CUNY. Um, uh, a troubling new phenomenon that we've been tracking um, is the attempt by anti-Zionists to deny Jewish students what we're calling the right to self-definition. So over the last year, there's been an explosion, really a quadrupling of students and faculty openly denying that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism or that Zionism is linked to Judaism or that linked to, to uh, Jewish identity. And we've also found, and this is the important part again, that there's a, a very strong link between these denials and acts of anti-Jewish harassment. The last thing that I'd like to mention is that although the COVID pandemic has forced schools across the country to rapidly shift to um, online learning and other campus spaces, sort of virtual campus, um, at least for the foreseeable future, we don't even know what's going to happen in the fall on most campuses, we believe that most of the anti-Zionist harassment that we've been seeing is definitely going to continue in one form or another. And our organization is gearing up for um, a campaign to demand that university administrators address this, uh, what we foresee um, as either bullying or cyberbullying or both in a way that ensures um, adequate and equal protection with the emphasis on equal protection for Jewish and pro-Israel students from bullying that seeks to silence them or exclude them from participation in campus life. So that's what I'd like to, to tell you about what's going on right now. Thank you so much. Uh, Max, I'd like to turn to you now. Uh, you unfortunately can provide firsthand experience of what you have suffered at Duke. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your involvement in DIPAC and what you and some of your friends have experienced and what you've heard from other students at Duke. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marsha, for hosting this. Uh, definitely something that's very useful and very pertinent, even as we are off campus and all going to school virtually. Um, so I am a graduating senior at Duke. For the last three years, I've been a co-president in the Duke Israel Public Affairs Committee. That's uh, DIPAC for short. That's our on-campus student group uh, that's affiliated with APAC. And we work to strengthen and support the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, by uh, means such as informing and educating students about the importance of the relationship and creating uh, connections with student leaders on campus who may uh, be the ones in the future making the decisions that impact uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship in substantial ways. Um, today, I guess I'm here to talk about what we would call detractor activity. Um, it, it's uh, unfortunately existent at Duke and other campuses across the country. I'll talk about three, uh, three uh, sort of categories. Um, the first being acts of defamation and uh, violence on social media, uh, pretty clear attacks against uh, members of, of our DIPAC group. I'll go into some of what SJP does on campus as well. And then I'll move into facing some of the anti-Israel bias and ultimately anti-Semitism in the classroom. Uh, to, to begin with a disclaimer, I guess, while what I discuss might seem a little shocking, um, it's not atypical for a, for a campus. In fact, I'd say that Duke is relatively mild in this regard. Um, you know, unless you're reading the Algo Minor on a daily basis, you might not hear about everything that goes on. But uh, everything that I'm going to discuss is, is definitely not unprecedented. And there are campuses that are experiencing um, issues uh, to a degree well beyond what we're experiencing at Duke. To begin with uh, issues of defamation and threats of violence, uh, there is a student who is affiliated with SJP 
who's uh, made pretty clear uh, threats against our DIPAC group. I'm going to share my uh, screen. I have a, I think it's best with a sort of visual aid. So if you could see uh, the screen, you'll see some of the social media posts that have been uh, made by a, a student affiliated with SJP. Um, on the left, uh, the post that you see is the initial is one of the initial posts that they made. Um, as as you can see, there's an image of uh, with clown faces superimposed. Uh, in response to this, uh, which we felt was uh, Duke. Uh, under the Duke, uh, student conduct definition of uh, harassment, we made a complaint with the Office of Student Conduct at Duke, and um, to, in in line with much of the administration and faculty um, unresponsiveness towards anti-Semitism on on campuses, uh, the the Student Conduct Office at Duke was no exception. Um, it, we uh, we we did somewhat have a um, of a reception with them, they they did collect evidence on the post that had been made by the student. Uh, they told us that we would have a chance to testify, possibly with with the student in in attendance at, at, at some sort of hearing. Uh, three weeks after making the complaint about this act of defamation, we were told that the case had been closed. Uh, no action had been taken against the student, uh, and and uh, that that was basically pr uh, presented to us as the end. Uh, after this uh, quote unquote end uh, from the Office of Student Conduct, the next two posts uh, in the center and the right on your screen were made. Um, actually, these posts were made on the same day. So the, the student had, uh, threat, had, a, had said that they would viciously attack uh, DIPAC. On the same day, they posted a picture of a woman holding a gun, uh, in, in the, in, in, and that can only be taken um, in, in, in the most serious manner, and, and, and we're definitely not the ones to, to underestimate uh, the potential uh, threats that, that could be posed, even by a, a single individual. Unfortunately, student conduct has continued their inactivity. Uh, we have made them aware of the uh, follow-up to this. Uh, and to be quite honest, this is an ongoing uh, issue. Uh, with this student and, and similar students who are also affiliated with the Students for Justice in Palestine group, uh, it, it, instead of really addressing the uh, the, the incident and taking uh, taking measures uh, to to stop this or taking measures against the student who is perpetrating, uh, they've told members of DIPAC to quote unquote watch their backs or uh, recommended that members of DIPAC uh, get police escorts when going to class. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll shift to some of the on-campus activities um, that SJP does. Uh, everything that I've discussed uh, could be viewed, I, I suppose, as a sort of one-off student who uh, is just kind of taking the initiative to do this themselves. We don't know if there's a if the student's being directed by any organized SJP effort. But what we do know is that SJP uh, organizes events such as the Apartheid Week on campus every year. Um, I'm going to shift my screen so that you can see the apartheid wall that SJP puts up um, at, at Duke. And uh, there's a couple things that you can note here. If you look at the panel on the wall to the furthest, uh, to, to, the, to the far left, you can see that it says Students for Justice in Palestine with Jewish Voice for Peace. And to make it very clear, there is no Jewish Voice for Peace organization at Duke. But what we see is that uh, SJP li likes to use JVP uh, at Duke and at all other campuses as a cover for themselves, essentially sending the message that if uh, they have Jewish supporters, therefore they cannot be anti-Semitic. Um, and, and another thing that uh, is, is pretty evident in this wall here um, is that SJP is trying to um, sort of fit itself sort of fit itself into uh, left-wing activism in general and any in any far-left causes that they can try to um, kind of uh, manipulate to their advantage. So we've seen examples of SJP trying to connect the quote-unquote Palestinian struggle with struggles against colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, etc. Anything that uh, anything that can get a sort of far-left reception, SJP will most definitely try to um, kind of uh, manipulate that discussion to their own advantage. And uh, what, what, what this is really an example of is this whole concept of intersectionality. 
uh, which uh, it would be worthy of a whole discussion itself. But uh, the, the notion that every sort of uh, difficulty that's faced, um, every institutional uh, struggle is, is connected. Um, and therefore, uh, SJP is making the claim that uh, their struggle is, uh, is somehow uh, connected to, to everything under the sun. And I think if you uh, were familiar with, uh, with what's gone on in Durham over the past couple of years, um, you'll be familiar with the analogy of the plight of uh, Palestinians to uh, police uh, brutality in the United States or the attempted connection um, to, to, to do that. And that's, a, that's just what I'm talking about. That is an example of the manipulation of the sort of intersectional um, ideology uh, to, to the benefit of SJP and their uh, ideological allies. Um, Unfortunately, what inter intersectionality has become on, on campuses uh, is, a, is, is a way to, to uh, alienate Jewish and pro-Israel students in many, in many ways from, uh, from causes that they might otherwise feel inclined to join. So, um, you know, if you are a Jewish student that does uh, feel very uh, strongly about, um, you know, climate change issues, for example, um, there is a good chance that you'll come into some sort of uh, obstacle if you wish to maintain your support for that issue and also maintain support for the Jewish state. Uh, shifting sort of to, uh, to uh, issues in the classroom, so everything that we've been discussing up to this point has been more of SJP activity, uh, but it's also uh, important to note that even if, you're, uh, if you try not to involve yourself uh, as a student in, 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 uh, in, in the discussion about Israel or Israel and Palestine or whatnot, it might still come up and you might be faced with it um, in, a dis in a classroom discussion or a classroom reading. I can give a couple examples of classes I've been in uh, where, it, where readings have been assigned that uh, whether the professor intends, uh, intends to assign anti-Semitic anti or anti-Israel readings or not, um, that's ulti ultimately been the case. Um, the first example I'll give is a book um, that was assigned as a reading and, and I'll just quote from the book real quickly. This book analyzes the significance of archaeology to the Israeli state and society and the role it played in the formation and enactment of its colonial national historic imagination and, this, and in the substantiation of its territorial claims. So essentially you have a quote unquote academic reading that is saying that Jews are European colonists coming in to invade uh, Palestine uh, and, and invade and, and take over the land of its uh, supposedly indigenous inhabitants. Another example I'll give is actually a book from an ethics class where the professor had no intention of assigning an anti-Israel reading. Uh, rather, this was a reading that's supposed to deal with ethics of climate change issues. Uh, but the person who was writing the book um, had an anti-Israel agenda, as is clear from their claim that they say Israeli soldiers spent the summer of 2014 killing Palestinians in Gaza. They say that this operation, Operation Protective Edge, was an Israeli attempt to prevent Palestinians from utilizing gas wells off the Gaza coast and steal the gas for Israeli use. Now, as with any sort of uh, academic uh, ac academic work, uh, you know, I'm looking in the sources to see where this where this comes from. They have one source from a piece in the Guardian uh, claiming that Operation Protective Veg was intended to uproot Hamas for instituting a puppet government that would be easier manipulated by Israel um, and uh, for, for a natural gas deal. And in order to, to make this change, Israel had to inflict mass civilian suffering to uproot Hamas. There's another piece that they cited uh, from a website, that, uh, website called globalresearch.ca. And they uh, basically reiterated the notion that this is uh, a deal to send natural gas stolen from the Palestinians. Um, and they quote that the terrorist threat uh, that i.e. the terrorist threat to Israel, is just a pretext to maintain Palestine under military occupation and continue to seal its land and resources. Now, I looked up a little bit more about what this globalresearch.ca is, and they're described on Wikipedia as a promoter of conspiracy theories and falsehoods on topics such as 9-11, vaccines, and global warming, as well as anti-Semitic falsehoods, suggesting that the U.S., Israel, and Britain are intent on controlling the world. And this is making it into academic readings at Duke University, and potentially other universities across the country as well. Uh, so it, it, in, in this, again, was a class where the professor had no anti-Israel intent. Uh, so just to show that there really is no way of uh, avoiding this um, if you do take certain types of classes. 
Uh, but again, I just want to end kind of by reiterating that while everything I've said uh, might be, you know, shocking to some or, or might, uh, you know, might be, uh, might sound unprecedented, it's most definitely not. And uh, as I think we'll probably be discussing uh, in the rest of this conversation, there's many other campuses and many other Jewish and pro-Israel students uh, that have faced uh, much worse acts of defamation or on-campus uh, anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism in the classroom. Thank you so much, Max. Carly, I'd like to come back to you. Could you tell us a little bit about what Stand With Us is and what is your role as director of the Center for Combating Anti-Semitism? And also, you are an attorney, and I'd like you to explain a little bit about the new ruling of Title VI and what that might mean for Jewish students on campuses. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so just real quickly, Stand With Us is an international nonprofit organization that was founded uh, almost 19 years ago. We're coming up on our 19th birthday, um, and has a we have a dual mission of supporting Israel and combating anti-Semitism around the world, um, and. We, we do that largely through education, uh, but we also do have a legal department. And, I, and so as far as my role, I wear two different hats in, within the organization, uh, at, at least. Um, but, but my primary role is as the director of the Center for Combating Antisemitism, which is a new initiative, a new division of Stand With Us that seeks to help others to identify anti-Semitism. Uh, and part of the way that we do that is by making sure to the to the best of our ability that we are encouraging a consistent definition of anti-Semitism. Um, that's, that's something that's happening uh, across the country in, in various contexts, uh, trying to get that implemented both uh, on college campuses, in legislative bodies. Um, again, just, uh, just so that when anti-Semitic activity occurs, we are able to readily identify it as such. Um, and then also to expose anti-Semitism when and where it occurs, and then as appropriate to take action against that. So uh, those are kind of the four uh, areas of focus for the center. Um, and so a lot of, uh, again, in keeping with Stand With Us's educational mission, uh, a lot of what we do at the center is educational. I do a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking, uh, talking about all the things that we're talking about today, as you know, as well as uh, just trying to bring some clarity to these issues. Uh, we also, again, in keeping with Stand With Us's record for this, we we have phenomenal educational resources that are available on our website. Um, and, and the center itself actually has a separate home online now, and it's uh, you can visit it at standuptohatred.com. Uh, one of the things that, that is also a new initiative that, that we are implementing both uh, in communities uh, and, and as well on campuses is working with law enforcement. Uh, we, have, we have a new initiative in which we are able to offer financial rewards for people who come forward with information that leads to arrest and conviction of an anti-Semitic hate crime. Uh, so again, these are these are things that the center is doing. Uh, and and it, again, because of my other role, uh, I work closely with the side-off legal department at Stand With Us, uh, again, because I am an attorney. And so uh, we, we have kind of given me the title of uh, counsel for litigation strategy. Even though we don't directly litigate, we work with a network of some 180 plus pro bono attorneys. Um, and, and so when there are legal situations that may require uh, outside representation, that's when I kind of step into that role and, and work with the, uh, the fine people of the side off legal department. Um, and so in that capacity, uh, as well as, as in my role as the director of the CCA, uh, again, because the, the two departments work so closely together, one of the things that, that we are uh, very focused on is this Title VI. Uh, and, and I want to be really clear uh, that there's not a new ruling. And, and again, this is, this is partially just the attorney in me to, to be sure that, that everyone understands exactly what it is and what it isn't. Um, what we're talking about is that at the end of last year in December, President Trump signed an executive order. And uh, rather than changing anything, what it did was clarify how the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights is supposed to investigate, and, and not just the Department of Education, actually all federal mm -hmm. agencies that are tasked with uh, in, enforcing Title VI. But for our purposes uh, today, really what we focus on is the Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights and how that entity is supposed to investigate potential anti-Semitic activity on campus uh, to determine whether there may have been a violation of Title VI. And so it's actually just, cons it's consistent with what the Office for Civil Rights has been doing. Um, and and it, the, the mandate 
in the executive order is simply that the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which is what we are encouraging um, in, in various contexts, that that's the definition that the agencies are to use in determining whether anti-Semitic activity has occurred and thus, you know, in, in the course of their investigation, whether that uh, poses you know, a violation of Title VI. Uh, and again, just for anyone who's not clear, when, when we talk about Title VI, a lot of times we talk about these things as though everyone knows what we're, what we're referring to. Title VI is, is part of the uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act. And so it's just a, a, a statute, a law that says that recipients of federal funding cannot discriminate uh, on the basis of race, color, or national origin. Um, one thing that I also want to be really clear about is that Jews, as a result of this executive order and as a result of Title VI, Jews are not classified as a race, uh, but but there has been a, a fairly longstanding um, implementation by the Department of Education that notes that if there is a shared ancestry of a group, uh, that, 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 kind of, that falls under the idea of, uh, of treating that uh, for purposes of legal uh, investigations and things like that uh, as, as a national origin. Uh, again, it's, it's not saying that Jews are a race or that Jews are, uh, you know, uh, anything other than what they are. It's not an attempt to define Jews and, and to cabin them off in, in any way. It's, it's simply just being consistent with the way the Department of Education and other agencies have, have been trying to, um, to work with with this construct, um, and so, uh, the and part of the reason that that is is because Title VI doesn't protect on the basis of religion. There are other provisions of federal law that do that, but Title VI is not one of them. And so, when there are groups, for example, Muslims, Sikhs, Jews, who may share a religion but also have a shared ancestry, um, then then the Department of Education has said that that is considered a protected class under Title VI. So, again, long-winded way of saying that um, that really nothing has changed. It's just a, a clarification and a consistency. And it's something that um, at Stand With Us, we've, we've been able to utilize um, I, I actually think it's going to be very helpful, or at least potentially can be very helpful to students, again, because it brings some consistency and some clarity uh, to this notion of what even is anti-Semitism. Um, it's, it's no longer this kind of nebulous idea of, oh, well, maybe we'll know it when we see it. Um, there, there are very specific uh, definitions and examples of what constitutes or what may constitute anti-Semitism. Again, it's a very context-based analysis that still has to take place, uh, but it does make clear what some of those examples are. And so, for example, we have a Title VI complaint that we submitted on behalf of a student at UCLA, and now this definition uh, will bring some clarity to the investigation in terms of whether the circumstances there actually were uh, in, in, did involve anti-Semitism and whether that was sufficient to find a violation of Title VI. Um, I do want to mention just a couple of other things, um, and, and specifically because of, of the audience largely that I know I'm in front of right now, uh, I, I do want to just say a, a thank you to the North Carolina community because I know that it has been extremely important and supportive of Stand With Us and our efforts uh, largely on campus. One of the things that, that we do each year to help educate college students about all of these issues, uh, we have an In Focus international conference that we host each year, and I know that, uh, that the community there, Marsha, has has been uh, very supportive in helping to make sure that students from that region are able to attend and to get education uh, and to learn these practical tools that we're going to be talking about in terms of, of combating and, and addressing the very things that Max talked about when those things happen on campus. Um, and so again, I, I'm very appreciative of that. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about uh, Stand With Us and, and what it is we do. Um, and and I, I just, I think that, um, that one of the, the most important things that, uh, you know, that we really can be doing right now is making sure that everybody who's listening to this and others, you know, are aware of all of the various uh, opportunities for educational resources, um, uh, like the ones that Amcha does, uh, like the booklets and, and the, obviously we're not, not speaking engagements right now other than online, but, you know, all these various opportunities for education about these issues. Because I, do, I think that largely what, what we are facing and what students like Max are facing uh, is a lack of education, uh, a lack of accurate information. And so uh, just really, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some of that and, and to, uh, to talk about that. So thank you. Thank you, Carly. Well, Joel, let's bring you into the conversation. Uh, just about everybody uh, participating 
in this webinar is probably an alum of a college and you are Associate Director of Alums for Campus Fairness. So tell us what that is and what we as alums might be able to do to support our students. Okay, thank you, Marsha. Um, and I'll just dive in a little bit about ACF and you hit the nail on the head. Almost everyone on this webinar is an alum of somewhere, went to a college somewhere. And what we are, what ACF is, what Alums for Campus Fairness is, is America's unified voice on issues of anti-Semitism, demonization of Israel and bigotry. And with over 40 chapters across the country, what we do is we position thousands of alumni on the front lines of key issues at our alma maters. And what we're trying to do is ensure that universities remain pillars of open dialogue and equal opportunity for all students. And we mean that, all students. And how we combat bigotry and anti-Semitism is we do it basically in three ways. One, we take alumni off the sidelines and galvanize them to stand up for students and professors who are dealing with anti-Semitism on campus. Second, we are holding university administration accountable when it comes to academic freedom and honest discourse. And we truly believe that these values should not be compromised for any group when we utilize our advantage as alumni to help accomplish that. And three, we work co co proactively with a coalition of partners to identify at-risk campuses. Um, the, the unique thing about alumni is there's always gonna be more alumni than there are faculty, staff, students, parents combined. So the question is, how do we target them? And it's important that we be selective and that we go to the campuses that have the most need. Um, and we are meeting a critical need today by unifying and amplifying the voice of alumni on campus. And the strategy is working. At Columbia University, we released our, we, our comprehensive dossier um, last fall titled A Hotbed for Hate, which got which pushed the Columbia administration into moving the needle on anti-Semitism. And recently, President Bollinger released a strong statement in defense of Jewish students on campus at Pitzer College. When Pit, the Pitzer College Student Council, um, as well as the Faculty Council, attempted to end the relationship between Pitzer College and the University of Haifa, we stood by President Oliver as he put his foot down and said, we are not going to do that. And, and the, the trustees of the university supported him and over, our, and over 400 alumni that we previously had no contact with came to us, said, we wanna help, we wanna support, and they showed that to the university. Or even at NYU, everything that's going on at NYU, we are standing by our students, whether it's um, SJP being re rewarded for their good faith and their cooperation, or whether it's an, a graduate speaker saying bad things about Israel and about the Jewish community, it doesn't matter and specifically at Duke. Last year in March, we actually were able to get in contact with a lot of Duke alumni to address the, um, the Gaza conference being co-hosted by UNC and Duke. And that's actually where we met, met Mike, who um, to be open, Mike is a part of our board and he's a significant piece of what we're doing in North Carolina abroad and specifically at Duke. Um, because we truly believe that alumni are the key or one of the keys to making sure that student, Jewish students on campus do not have to be confronted with anti-Semitism at every corner. And alumni can, can influence both reputation and development of a university. And we don't have to have the same, um, we don't have the same repercussions that a student might, might have in terms of their grade potentially being changed or a parent might have in terms of the fear that something might happen to their student, a faculty losing, losing not having a renewal of their contract we have the ability to influence, and I think each, each and every single person on this call has the ability, and, and I think the students need them to step forward and to become a part of the campus community in a more impactful and, and visible way. So how would an alum get involved in Alums for Campus Fairness? And let's move into kind of concrete suggestions that not only alums, but parents, grandparents, uh, interested in supportive faculty. What are some practical uh, suggestions that, that you might want to make? The first step is getting connected with us. Before you take any action, getting connected with us, because at, at the end of the day, the one thing that we do better, than, the one reason we exist is to provide a filter between alumni and the university to make sure that any action that our alumni take and any initiative that is important to the community is following the right process, that we're talking to the right people, and that we're having the right conversations. Um, and you can either go to our website, www.campusfairness.org. We have a secure portal in which you can communicate about anything, and it's, 
and it's not vulnerable to um, infiltrators through Facebook or through Twitter or whatever, or WhatsApp, whatever have you. And you can also reach out to Mike Ross. Um, as I said, Mike Ross is a valuable piece of our team there. He basically leads our effort at, at Duke and you can connect through our chapter, either through our website or through Mike Ross. Now, basically what we're doing during this time, this is a lot. Um, and yes, we've changed our fight to fighting from home, not on campus, but there's a lot of ways you can remain vigilant about your alma mater. And by and how, how do you remain vigilant? First, you have to determine the key stakeholders that you can engage. And you have to keep your community and your chapter in the know. Um, how do you keep them in the know? You can write an op-ed, op you can write a letter to the editor in the local paper, you can be a part of our social media campaigns and you can actually help us organize them that evolve, whether it may be Facebook ads, Google ads, uh, boosted posts, um, you know, video content, text content, whatever it may be. And then even after you take action, that action isn't going to go anywhere if we don't have a large enough network and if we're not amplifying the voice. So it's also important that whoever's on this call, that you're letting your friends know about who we are, what we do, and why it's important that they get involved. How effective do you think it is for alums to act independently, to write letters to the board of trustees or the chancellors or presidents to threaten or actually withhold donations? Do, do you think those are good steps for alums to take? Overall, acting independently and doing that is generally not effective. The ones that are effective generally ha happen to be alumni who are either 1A, you know, large donors to a university, so they might have their namesake on a building, or they have some sort of personal relationship with the president or the administrative staff. Outside of that, it, th the strategies are generally ineffective. And even the people that have those connections, we try to take them into our wing and try to work with them to coordinate with the university or whoever it may be. Because I think a lot of the time that we're, what we're seeing on campus, and I saw it on my, on my campus when I was a student, and student, students come to me with these stories all the time, is an alumni taking action at a university without talking to anybody. And that actually can actively hurt the efforts of the Hillel or the students on the ground or the local regional com community organizations that are working on the issue. And sometimes those efforts that are independent and are good in nature um, can actually hurt the effort overall and can desensitize certain administrators from working with pros or groups and individuals. Thank you. So Tammy, um, I'd like to come over to you. You represent the faculty voice on this panel, as well as your role of AMCA initiative, kind of monitoring what's going on across the nation. What suggestions do you have for people that are supportive of the students, uh, what, what can they do? Or what can students do? I think you are on mute. Let's see. Uh, there yeah, you. there you go. There you go. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, suggestions. I, I actually have a couple of suggestions. Um, we are not as directly involved as, let's say, stand with us uh, directly with students, but I do have a couple of, of, of suggestions of what people who are um, participating in this webinar can, can do, and students or parents or what we call sort of stakeholders. The first thing that I, at least from our perspective, that I would um, ask them to do is that if um, somebody's son or daughter or a student that they know experiences or witnesses anti-Semitism at his or her college university, whether it's a, sort of on a physical campus or a virtual campus at this point, I would urge you or the student to report it to us either um, through our website uh, amcha-initiative.org, A-M-C-H-A-initiative.org. Uh, there's a submit incident button in our menu or uh, to email it to us, administrator at amcha-initiative.org. Um, that way, if it's appropriate, and with, of course, with the permission of the student or whoever submits the incident, uh, we can include it in our database to just keep everybody sort of up to date on incidents that are happening across campus. We can also try to help the student if we're able to. 
um, or to refer him or her to one or more of our organizational allies for assistance like Carly's group or, or other uh, groups if, for instance, they need legal assistance. Um, second, as a college or university stakeholder, that's you who are watching this, whether you're a student, a parent, a grandparent, an alum, a faculty member, or just a taxpayer, uh, just a citizen, you have every right to demand that you or a student you care about is equally protected from harassing behavior that impedes a student's freedom of expression or violates their right to fully participate in campus life. Um, after all, that's the educational experience that students are paying, uh, maybe some, are, uh, some of you are paying, uh, tens of thousands of dollars um, a year to actually have. And, and um, if you're being, you know, harassing behavior, which infringes on any student's educational experience, has got to be addressed promptly and vigorously, um, and most importantly, fairly, by university administrators. And I would say that this has to be irrespective of the identity of the victim or the motivation of the perpetrator. Every time stakeholders communicate with schools regarding the harassment of Jewish or pro-Israel students, I think they need to state this message um, loudly and clearly, adequate and equal protection for Jewish and pro-Israel students and all students. So those are, the, those are the two things that I would recommend, Marcia, for the people um, who are on this call. Great, thank you. Carly, what about suggestions? Yeah, so um, like uh, like Tammy said, we we are uh, kind of the go-to, the 911, uh, specifically the side-off legal department at Stand With Us for students who are in need of assistance with regard to anti-Semitic or activity or anti-Israel extremism. Um, it's not it's not an analysis that a student necessarily needs to try to make on his or her own. And so that's why we're there so that if and when that happens, that can be reported immediately and we can work directly with the students. Uh, we, so we've been doing that for years and, and very successfully. So and I would say that's that's one of the first things. And and I guess that kind of falls under the heading of knowing what resources are available. And so knowing, you know, what Ancha does and, and what it's available to do, knowing what Stand With Us is available to do and, uh, you know, visiting the websites and just educating yourself a little bit about uh, who, you know, who are we and, and what do we do and what do we offer, um, you know, in a little more detail than we have time to go into maybe today. Um, one of the other things that I think is crucial if, you know, for those who are watching this, if you're thinking about not just students who are currently on campus, but, you know, uh, children, grandchildren who are going to be on campus in the next few years, uh, or, you know, even if it's going to be 10 or 15 years, start educating them now, not only about, you know, the, these types of issues about anti-Semitism and anti-Israel activity, anti-Zionism, you know, make sure that they have that foundation and understand what what these words even mean. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I run into crowds, and and, and I'll, I'll just say this full disclosure, I'm not Jewish, and so sometimes it does surprise me when I'm speaking to Jewish groups, um, the the confusion around Zionism and anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, and so, you know, using the resources that are available to educate students at a very young age, you know, and Stand With Us has resources to do that as well. We have programs that are in schools, uh, our link program, but also just have uh, things online that, that are uh, very concise and, and helpful educational resources for that purpose. I, again, I just can't stress enough how crucial it is to begin having those conversations and begin that education at a very early age. Um, and, and also looking at colleges at college campuses and their track record on on these various things and again uh you know tammy's information is extremely helpful for that to to kind of have an idea of what should or could i expect on this campus versus that campus and of course there's no guarantee but still kind of having an understanding of um for example knowing what what your students uh in, intend to pursue academically and then looking at the departments uh, websites and kind of getting an idea for who who's going to be their professor in this and, and what's their background and you know what is there an agenda that that seems to be uh, being pushed by this particular person you know just again it, it's education on a number of different fronts and and I have to say this as I was listening to Max earlier uh, I, I'm I'm constantly amazed and you know Max you're one of the many students that, that I've heard from and spoken with uh, you know you have a, a full plate 
just to get your degree. I mean, you have a full plate and, and yet you have to go above and beyond to educate yourself. Uh, you know, every, at, it seems like at every turn. Um, and so one, I just want to commend you and, and all the other students who are doing that um, because it is extremely impressive and it is a tall order, uh, but but it's unfortunately, it's the reality that we live in. And so again, it's it's our privilege at Stand With Us to be here to, to walk alongside and to support you in that, uh, but also just, you know, really thankful that, that there are students like this who are doing it. And so again, that's kind of my encouragement is to, to help students from an early age with the resources that are available to get to that point so that they know how to respond when these things confront them. Thank you. Max, I'm going to turn to you, but I, I'm disappointed because I mentioned I was a college administrator. I spent 30 years at University of North Carolina, and I was at two other universities as well. And my first reaction would be to tell a student, well, go to the Dean of Students, go to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, you know, file your complaint there. But it sounds like you tried to go through the channels and you really didn't have any positive response. So I'm going to ask you, you know, what suggestions would you have? and what recourse do you have at this point? Yeah, so I, I think one of the main things is, uh, you know, if you hear about like a, a conference, like the Gaza conference that was co-hosted by Duke and UNC, um, you know, you can send a message uh, to Joel at, at ACF um, and, and, and then send a message also to the, to the student uh, groups at, at, at Duke and UNC. Um, I think it's very important that um, you go through the channel, like, you know, ACF to, formally get uh, get your voice heard amongst the alumni. And then also just ask the students at Duke and UNC, you know, what can I do to support your effort? Um, you know, what, what can I possibly do to, uh, you know, help as you try to, you know, go through this issue of, of facing, uh, you know, institutionalized anti-Zionist uh, and anti-Semitic uh, activity. Uh, it, it, and I think, you know, we have tried uh, to go through Kind of the formal, um, formal campus ways of, of addressing issues like harassment. Um, unfortunately, I think part and parcel with SJP's attempt to uh, kind of involve itself with the um, you know with with all the left wing causes with this intersectionality as we were talking about uh, the administration, uh, you know, student conduct, uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, you know, any sort of similar organization, similar administrative body at any campus is going to be very hesitant to crack down on students that are seen as activists or leaders in a, uh, in a, in a cause that they see as worthy. Um, and that's what SJP tries to portray themselves as. They try to kind of ingratiate themselves with uh, the people that would otherwise be seen as, you know, leading in the most progressive front for uh, what are often seen on, cam on campus as the most worthy and uh, most urgent causes. Uh, so I think that's where the, the that's where kind of the trickiness comes in. I think that's where much of the hesitation to address uh, anti-Semitism when it comes from the so-called left-wing side. Um, it, you know, I think that's where it comes in. I think it's pretty evident when you try to compare the uh, faculty response or lack thereof to uh, issues of you know, as I was describing, threats of violence or uh, harassment of of uh, pro-Israel students, uh, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. Uh, compared to the example of like a, a swastika. We've had a, had a few swastikas drawn at Duke. Um, and, and while the response to those may be insufficient in itself, uh, there's still a much quicker, a more robust response that's, that's uh, from the top of the, you know, you know from uh, the president of the university on down. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty quick response to those sorts of things. Uh, whereas they are very hesitant to touch the issue of, you know, the so-called left-wing anti-Semitism uh, because of, what that could mean in terms of being seen as cracking down on students who are raising their voices on, you know, what are, would seem to be important issues in, in, in other, in other ways. So um, I think that's where kind of the trickiness comes in and that's where it becomes important to, um, you know, have that voice of, of many alumni coming together and making it absolutely clear to the university that this will not be tolerated. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of what ACF offers uh, in terms of the alumni uh, component. Thank you. We're going to have kind of a, a lightning round for our final question, and then we'll spend about 20 minutes answering as many questions from the audience as we have time for. And if some of you do have to leave uh, at this point or earlier, 
uh, or before we finish at 5.30, we, as I said, we will be recording the session. So you can answer the questions and see the responses uh, through the link. So Max, I'm going to start with you. There are lists, AMCA Initiative produces a list, and there are lists of incidents that have occurred on various campuses. If you were choosing a school all over again, with knowing some of the things that you experienced, the harassment, the intimidation because of your pro-Israel activism, would you choose Duke again? And would you advise a student to avoid a school that has had uh, and is known for quite a bit of anti-Israel activity? Uh, so uh, personally, the answer for me is yes. Uh, and I would never want to advise a Jewish or pro-Israel student to avoid a campus out of fear. Um, I think that's counterproductive. I think, um, you know, if if a, a student is is willing to, you know, engage in, in the conversation, I, I don't think it's ever, you know, we're ever going to make progress if we just try to avoid the issue altogether. With that said, if a student is, you know, very intent on getting their degree and and kind of, you know, building the resume, moving on to the next stage, and, and they know that they don't want to be involved in, you know, the, the Israel, you know, activism or, or, or whatnot, uh, you know, it might be a wise choice to not choose this few schools around the country where it's, you know, it, it's absolutely at its worst. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's the reason to, I don't think there's um, anything to avoid. Um, I just think it's unfortunately a, a, a difficulty that we have to uh, do our best to address when, when, it, when we face it. Thanks. Carly, what about stand with us position or your own personal opinion about this? Yeah, I'll, I'll offer my personal opinion. Um, I, I tend to agree with Max on that. I, I think um, I've had opportunities over the years to talk to a lot of students, uh, even when I was in law school as an attorney talking to law students. And um, one of the things that I, I quickly learned, you know, there there's constantly that question of what's your best piece of advice, you know, for someone who's about to enter this stage of life, you know, and, uh, and, and I quickly learned that my, uh, really my only piece of advice is two words. It's always the same. It's two words. It's know yourself. Um, because each person as Max, I think was basically trying to get at each, each person is, is unique and their goals are unique and their, um, their, their desires. And so if, if you, um, you know, if you want to be involved in, in this world, you know, in, in the activist world, uh, then certainly, I, I, when I say want to, I mean, if it's something you're willing to do uh, and, and to put yourself in that position, uh, then, then certainly there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I, I think that it, the key, though, is knowing what it is to the best of your ability based on your research and, and educating yourself, knowing what it is you're stepping into uh, and knowing yourself and, and you know, what that's going to look like for you. Um, I, I it, it does break my heart to know that so many students step onto college campuses and kind of feel like their experience is ruined, um, that they don't get to have the complete experience that they thought they were going to get to have. Um, I, I think that that's, um, I, and I don't use the word unfair a lot, uh, but but I think it is eminently unfair. Um, I think it's wrong. It's discriminatory. Uh, it's why, it's largely why I do what I do. Um, but I think that knowing uh, to the best of your ability what it is you're going to be stepping into is is you know, is the best way to approach that. Uh, and again, and just knowing yourself and, and what's going to work for you and, and maybe what's not. Um, I also think that that part of what you can do in that regard is visit those campuses and talk to students like Max, you know, talk to students who are involved in that and, and kind of get an idea of what's the campus climate like here. So it, again, you, you have, um, you know, the best opportunity to, to approach that based on what you do know about yourself and your own goals. Thank you. Tammy, I know that uh, many parents and prospective students use AMCA initiative to research the campuses that they're investigating. And sometimes they are using that to make decisions about campuses to choose or campuses to avoid. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I would have a caveat for anybody who would, who would use that as the sole um, uh, indicator of whether to send a kid or whether a student would want to go to a campus. As everybody is saying, this is, you know, the, the choice of what school to go to is such a complex decision. It's really very multidimensional. You can't reduce it to one uh, dimension, like how many anti-Israel or anti-Semitic um, uh, incidents you find on Amcha's website, for instance. I mean, and as Carly was saying, my first 
uh, reaction is, who are you? Or who is your son or daughter? Um, and, and how connected are they to Jewish life in general, to Israel advocacy sort of in particular? How comfortable do they feel standing up for Israel, defending the Jewish people? Um, even though some campuses can be really anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, um, some students, it will bother them, others, it won't faze them, and others will see it as a real challenge and will want to, it will bring out the best. And I also think another, another thing that I would suggest that's important, again, depending on the student, is the sort of the, what, what the, the Jewish and pro-Israel support system looks like on that campus, right? If there's a strong Hillel or a Chabad or a strong pro-Israel advo advocacy groups, it could be that working with these other uh, Zionists and groups to defend Israel or on a very anti-Zionist campus, that that's really the experience of a lifetime for some kids. That's what they'll look back on most fondly when they're thinking about their campus life. So I think it's so individual. Um, with respect to anti-Israel um, professors and departments, I also echo what Max was saying that 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 could be a problem, depending on what your student wants to study. Uh, certainly STEM fields are less of a problem than, um, let's say, so social sciences or humanities, um, Middle East studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, English, anthropology, sociology, history. All these could be um, very problematic or not, depending on the concentration of anti-Zionist faculty. There, too, you can go to our website um, we we have we, we keep track of all the all the faculty members that have signed uh, petitions of uh, support for the academic boycott of Israel. Right? It doesn't mean that they're going to bring it onto campus. It doesn't mean that they're not going to be fair or good professors. But it is an indication of where their heart lies, um, and it and our research shows that they um, oftentimes feel comfortable about bringing it into class. So that could make a difference. So those are the things that I would suggest. Thank you. Joel, thoughts on this? I think you're on mute. Joel, you are on mute. Mute. Sorry. So the <laughs> to reiterate the question, is the question about whether you would suggest or not suggest a campus based on anti-Israel activity occurring on the campus, correct? Yes. Um, in my personal opinion, uh, I would never suggest someone to not go to a specific campus because anti-Israel activity has occurred on a campus for several reasons, one of which um, there's no telling when and where anti-Semitism anti or anti-Israel bias is going to strike. We are seeing new campuses every year, every semester being hit with waves of anti-Semitism in the form of BDS or in the form of harassment and intimidation or even just simple seeing a swastika on the, on the um, backside of a bathroom stall. So it's basically unaffordable, uh, unavoidable unless you're going to go to Tel Aviv University or Hebrew University and then you, you might deal with it in the community in different forms. So my suggestion to people always is to do your research weigh your options, weigh what you consider priorities for the campus, and really consider if you're going to go to, if you're really considering going to a, uh, a campus with a long history of anti-Semitism, what that means to your ability to learn in peace, to build a community in peace, to really have a fulfilling social um, career on, at your college, and really have a good time. And those are the things that most matter. But I would never suggest that, you know, we, I have conversations with parents all the time. And I, and I always suggest they say, oh, I don't want to send my, my, my kid to this particular campus. And I'll say, look, this campus is dealing with a lot, but I think you should really weigh the decision not to specifically send them to a campus because things are happening, because we're seeing new campuses every day. And if that's the standard, um, I, I, don't, I don't want us to be left with at, at a few campuses where, you know, all the Jews go to a handful of campus. And then as we see at some campuses, um, I think all of us know there, there are Jewish students there, but a campus like um, Swarthmore, uh, the, the Jewish enrollment has drastically decreased in the last couple of years. And that has directly affected the uh, climate of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel bias on campus. So there's also externalities by 
telling a bunch of parents and students that they shouldn't apply to a campus and therefore go to a campus, it also can help to create a situation that makes it untenable for future Jewish or pro-Israel students to go to until that, you know, unless that climate, you know, organically dissipates. Thank you very much. I, I would just want to add that Duke was one of those schools that was never really seen as a problem school. Like in my, in my freshman year, once we had the um, Israel resolution and the Durham city council uh, and, and the sort of activist movement in the Durham community and, and, and on campus at Duke as well, that were working together. That's when SJP began, you know, in earnest and, and it starts up really quickly. Uh, it escalates really quickly. Uh, so there's really no telling in, in uh, you know, what, what you're getting yourself into in, in you know, four years down the road uh, when you first start out at a school. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Dr. Mike Ross. Um, Mike is the co-founder and co-president of Voice for Israel. There he is. And Mike is going to read some of the questions that we've received, and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them by 5.30. Uh, thank you, Marsha, and thank you all the panelists. This has been so enlightening. Um, a lot of the comments on the Q&A are just compliments to you all for, for your uh, dedication to this very important topic. I I'm going to start with my own uh, question um, and address it to Tammy, because as an a, uh, alumnus um, and somebody who's connected with a lot of schools, I find, uh, and I share this with many of my friends, we're not sure what we can really do. And, and ACF is great, and I love participating with them. But I think it would be important for people to understand the power dimensions that are present in a university. Uh, how powerful are uh, professors and administrators, and how sensitive are they to influencers like myself? Um, who want to be influencers? How do we reach them? And, and how, what are their thoughts as we sort of raise a complaint or a, a concern? Well, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I think a lot of times people don't understand the power dynamics at universities um, when they try to sort of make inroads or changes or address issues. The, there is this thing called shared governance where um, presidents or administration and faculty really share the governance of the university. The, the faculty pretty much have control over all academic matters, right? What happens in the classroom, developing the curriculum, they're the experts on that, right? Administrators aren't. They have management degrees, not degrees in physics or ethnic studies even, right, necessarily. So they're, but they, they have to make sure that every all of the rules and laws are followed, right? That every that the management of the university happens. The the but the the truth sort of that's the, the the truth is that they share. I mean the the fact is that they share power. I would say the the truth is that that I, I think that the faculty have more power in a sense because they're tenured, right? And and faculty are forever university presidents come and go. And oftentimes, if, the, if they get out of sorts with the faculty, they, they can be, um, uh, you know, hounded out of their positions, like Lauren Summers at Harvard a number of years ago. Um, so it's, there is a delicate balance. Um, I, I, I'd say that it's, it's, it's pretty difficult for, fa for outsiders to influence faculty, right? Because they're not academics they're not they don't have they don't have the expertise to be able to say you shouldn't be teaching that what you're teaching is wrong what you're teaching is biased right it's even though it might be if 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 they're if they're a tenured faculty member they they're the experts and so it's really a hard, and so you are in in a sense violating their academic freedom and even though you think and you might be right that they're abusing academic freedom. It's very difficult to make that case from the outside, right? And so I think that what, at least what we've tried to do with respect to faculty, because it seems like that's the issue that you're bringing up if you're, if you're wondering about faculty and their relationship here, there, that there are, there are certain norms and standards of the profession 
right? What constitutes scholarship? What constitutes indoctrination, right? The fact that political indoctrination is not supposed to happen in a classroom, right? Now, a, a professor can say that that's educational, but the question is, is it really? And the people who have to decide that are not us, it's them. It's the faculty bodies that need to sort of be watchdogs over themselves. If they're not doing their job, then we have to say, you're not doing your job to sort of police yourself, to, to actually uphold the norms and standards of the profession. But, but I, I think it's, it's, at least with respect to professors, it's, it's wrong for us to say to a university, you need to fire this professor, right? It's just not our place. And we could say it, and of course we have said it lots of times, but it, it not only will it ring, it, it will ring hollow because who are we? But it, it, it undermines our ability to actually make a difference because we suggest that we actually don't understand the university and how it works. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Um, and, and this segues into a, a question, a lot of questions for um, Max, and it has to do with power as well. Do students fear retaliation from professors or the administration? And uh, have you personally, uh, when, when you were confronted with curricula that seems so biased, what happened if you went to the professor to uh, ask for a clarification or an explanation? Yeah, well, uh, that's a great question. And I think actually in, in one of the cases I was discussing in one of the uh, readings I quoted from, I actually did go up to the professor um, and he had no intention of assigning the anti-Israel reading. And that's where I actually was able to, you know, make a sort of statement to, to the class just about why this really doesn't belong um, in, in an ethics, in an ethics 101 class it was. So um, I think that, you know, if, if, if students do address professors, which there is a power dynamic there as well, um, then, you know, there is a chance that the professor, because the academia is so inundated with the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, sometimes bias, um, that there can be, uh, you know, professors who assign this, um, you know, without the intent. But I guess when um, the, the issue, I think, a, a lot of times comes in not with the professors that do intend to be anti-Israel, but the professors uh, and the faculty members that would stand up on behalf of students who are facing these issues um, and like students themselves, you know, face backlash from their peers and face and, 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 and worry that, you know, standing up um, is just not worth it, you know, given the potential benefit versus the cost of really being ostracized. And the same thing goes for students. It's, it's a really analogous sort of, um, you know, situation. Just, you know, are you, are you willing to risk being ostracized from, you know, sort of left-wing causes if you choose to associate or, or, or your peers, if, if they hear that you're so pro-Israel, uh, because, you know, I, I think maybe as we'll address, uh, you know, being pro-Israel is associated with being, you know, right-wing, and, and that comes with a whole, you know, set of connotations on college campuses. So um, I think it's, uh, I think there is a lot of intimidation that students and faculty face. Um, I think one thing that could get students to be more active in general is to see faculty as kind of a standing up and, and, and making their voice heard. And I think students might follow. Uh, but again, you know, faculty are in, are in just as tough, if not more, a more tough position than the students. Uh, I had a question. Have there been any um, decisive victories by filing a, t a, a Title VI complaint? Uh, or are most of the complaints still uh, going on? I guess, Carly, that would be for you. Yeah, so, yeah, so the the primary ones, the ones that I'm aware of uh, that, that really kind of started being filed about a year ago are all still in process. Um, or I, I guess the one, and it wasn't as a result of a Title VI filing, uh, but the Department of Education has already stepped in with regard to the Gaza conference, uh, the Duke-UNC Gaza yeah. conference, and said that, that there were problems there. So that actually was, I think, encouraging to uh, a number of others that, okay, so that we, we've got the attention of the department now. Um, and so then, you know, we've kind of built upon that and, and built upon the executive order and, and the, the assistance that that provides. So, uh, but, but, but the, the short answer is yes, that they're all still in process. They're all still being investigated. Um, and, 
you know, obviously it's, it's anyone's guess. Um, and, and, and I think I want to be really clear about something too. Um, some of these may end up um, with a resolution that, that says just definitively there was no Title VI violation. That doesn't mean that there was an anti-Semitic activity. The standard under Title VI uh, isn't just was there discriminatory activity or was there anti-Semitic, you know, in, in these cases, activity, uh, but it has to, it has to interfere, uh, I think Tammy said this earlier, it has to interfere with uh, the students. It has to be a, a pervasive uh, a kind of environment of, of harassment that interferes with and in some way uh, inhibits a student from fully participating in the programs and activities of the university. Uh, and, and that can be a, a single situation or sometimes it takes a pattern um, at, at a particular university. Um, so I, I, I do think that that's really important to understand that, that there's, a, there's a difference between whether there actually was anti-Semitic activity, anti-Israel um, activity, whatever it may be, and whether there was a violation of Title VI. Um, and so I, I don't think that some of these, even if there's not a violation of Title VI, it's still on the radar um, of, of the department. Um, and, and it's part of the record now at whatever particular university that may be. Uh, and so it's on, the, the university is on notice as well. And that's another uh, important reason to, to be vigilant and to bring these things to the attention uh, of the department and to file these Title VI claims. I, again, uh, the hope, obviously, yes, is is that we get some some decisive victories out of this. No, no question. Uh, but but yes, we're still waiting on those. Uh, this is a short answer question, I think. Uh, are you anybody on the panel aware of any particular uh, student, faculty, or administrative person whose mind was actually totally changed uh, in a one hundred eighty degree uh, direction after being shall we say, anti-Israel turning to, pro, to a pro-Israel perspective? I think the follow-up question was probably going to be what, what was the reason they did, but uh, anybody have any, any comments? It's okay if you don't. Uh, will, I'll say this. Um, I'm, I'm off the top of my head. I can't think of, certainly can't think of 180 degree change. Um, but but I, again, something that we tell our students all the time, when you're having these discussions, and it's important to have these, you know, to engage in dialogue, um, you know, to listen, to, to, to really hear what the other person is saying. And, and what we try to make clear, you know, I say this a lot, is even if the person you're talking to doesn't walk away saying, oh, oh, I just didn't know at all. I absolutely, I 100% agree with you now. If the student or, or you know, if the individual that you're, you're having the dialogue with says something like, oh, I didn't know that, or I'll have to think about that, that's a win because we're, you know, we, we talk a lot about the 10, 80, 10, right? And there's 10% uh, of, of people who are generally anti-Israel, and then there's 10% that are pretty staunchly pro-Israel, and then it's the 80% that we're really trying to educate uh, and, and try to make sure that we reach with accurate information. And so if that person is part of that 80% who before was leaning, you know, against, and at least says, oh, well, I'll have to think about that. Or, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, any, anything that indicates, you know, an open mind, that's a win. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that at both the UNC Duke conference, which for those of you that are not aware of it, I, I won't go into the whole explanation of it, but it was called the conflict in Gaza, and it was basically five hours of Israel bashing. Uh, Stand With Us was very, very helpful in providing some of us a sheet of information that gave true facts about the conflict in Gaza, and many of us were there at six o'clock in the morning standing in the rain, uh, handing out these sheets. The same with uh, when Linda Sarsour was brought to campus, and we knew that she also was going to malign Israel. Stand With Us provided us with handouts. And some of the people refused to take them, but I would say probably 80% of them at least picked them up. And maybe we got through to somebody that read some of that information and suddenly perhaps questioned what they were going to be hearing as they went into the conference. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to reiterate what Carly said. I think for us on campus, uh, the goal is, you know, I think the question misses the mark in the sense that, uh, you know, we're not really concerned with changing anyone's mind who's already been convinced, you know, one way or the other. The, the, the point is most people haven't been convinced one way or the other. And it's about getting, you know, the faculty who 
are kind of on the fence or the faculty who do would support Israel, but don't see the benefit uh, enough of speaking out for Israel or the student who would support Israel, but don't see the benefit enough compared to the cost of, of what we discussed that could potentially cause to them. Just causing that risk benefit calculation to change a little bit more in, you know, in favor of the benefits um, is, you know, it, it, it can make the, the whole difference. Mike, we probably have time for one more question. If we still have some that haven't been answered. Well, um, I had a lot of questions for Max. Quick answers. Um, uh, have you filed a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights? So there was a complaint filed with the Office of Civil Rights after the Gaza conference. And uh, we followed that up with a complaint um, about some of the intimidation and harassment uh, that do that was allowed that was in violation of Duke's subsequent arrangement with the office. So uh, there is an ongoing situation with uh, with federal government. Um, but I have a broader question. Uh, it's, I, I'm going to combine two separate questions. Uh, one was. Does the hyperpartisan atmosphere, which exists now and leading up to the election in 2020, is that going to affect campus? And a sort of a similar question, can anybody think of a similar debated topic like the Israel-Palestine conflict that is a model for conflict discussion on campus? Um, like abortion rights versus pro-life or something that there right. is a reasonably amicable so, discussion on right. campus. So yeah, and I, I, this is where it really needs to be stated that the Israel discussion is just one of many discussions that uh, has been, you know, hijacked by one end or where there really isn't good communication or where there's uh, the faculty intent to basically uh, create activists in the classroom versus teaching the students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, all that contributes to whether it's Israel or a whole, you know, list of issues, um, you know, just severe uh, partisanship um, that can only be exacerbated by the partisanship in the media in whatever. I think one of the problems is there is no precedent for that sort of uh, a productive conversation to happen. So I think we have to create that ourselves. Okay, I think we're out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a topic that could be discussed for hours and hours. And maybe uh, because of the strong interest, maybe we'll continue to explore this topic at another date. But I want to thank our panelists for all the amazing information that you presented. And uh, I think a lot of us are going to have some sleepless nights because it raises some very thorny issues that uh, are not easily solved. I also want to thank Stand With Us and AMCA Initiative and Alums for Campus Fairness for their partnership. Uh, Mike, were you going to say one? I, I was just going to say one of the disadvantages of Zoom is you can't hear any applause. But okay. I, I can imagine that there'd be a lot of applause right now. And I want to thank everybody who, who participated as a panelist. Really, uh, you were all great. Thank you, Absolutely. each and every thank one of you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And stay healthy and safe. Yes, you too. All of you too. You too. Bye-bye.